Hello everyone and welcome back to Midweek with Pastor Mike. Today we are opening chapter 13 of Paul's letter to the Romans, where Paul is going to continue this discussion that he began in chapter 12 about how we are transformed in our relationships through the renewing of our minds by the law of love. And so, so far we've looked at how our relationship to God is transformed, how our relationship to ourselves is transformed, how our relationships to others, both friend and enemy, inside and outside of the church, uh, is transformed by that love. And then today, uh, with Pastor Mike's insight and wisdom, we're going to consider how our relationships are transformed as citizens of the state. So welcome, Pastor Mike, and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Today is, I just have to admit... uh, a chapter I personally haven't really been looking forward to in terms of entering into a political discussion, and yet I recognize the importance of what of the instruction that Paul's giving here because the reality is, until Christ returns, we live in a state as as a sort of a dual citizenship, duels of citizens of the kingdom of heaven and citizens of the place that the Lord puts us. Yeah, we we have dual citizenship in that sense, but the citizenship of the kingdom is far greater. Absolutely. And so Paul, in chapter 13, seems to appeal to what he has uh, presented to us, the character of who we are as citizens, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, those who offer ourselves as living sacrifices in view of God's mercy, governed by love. And he's going to apply that now to our relationship to the law, to the state, to our neighbor, and even to our understanding of Christ's ultimate return. Yeah. So let's take those things one at a time and jump straight in to our text for today. I'll read beginning at verse 1, Romans 13, and I'll read down to verse 7. Paul says this, he says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to God's wrath, but also, not not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Mm. Pretty powerful passage of scripture, that's for sure. Absolutely. And I think it's apropos to the time that we live in now as to how much of government we choose to obey. Mm -hmm. And we've just finished a time in our culture of the coronavirus, which was extremely controversial, yes. where we had one segment of Christian church uh, that basically said, I even read one pastor who said, if you come to church and you wear a mask, you will be asked to leave. Wow. And that, that, that to me was like, are you got to be kidding me? <laughs> and, then the, so, and then at the other extreme, there was, let's not have any church, let's hide and let's just never get together at all and i live in fear yeah yeah yeah. so there's a there's obviously a responsibility of the government that is intersecting with the church and the authority of the church and so we've got to figure out what do we do in those situations absolutely yeah thank you for just bringing that straight into uh, our current culture and context so we understand that what paul's speaking about and to here is is highly um, applicable to us today. We, Absolutely. We need to understand these yeah. things. So I always start off with asking people, what is government? Mm. You know, what what is government? Obviously, it's ordained of by God. But one of the things that government is, is pretty clearly it is force. Mm. 
that the government has the power to force you to do what you need to do to be a citizen in that government. But in so enacting that force, that force needs to be in alignment with God. Mm -hmm. And when there is no alignment with God, such in a place like Nazi Germany, then we have the obligation and responsibility to resist that and not to do it. And that's always a discerning and a difficult challenge. At what point do I obey government? And at what point do I walk away from that and say, I cannot in good conscience participate in what they're doing? And not only in good conscience, but I will suffer the consequences if a government chooses or asks me or forces me to do something that I do not feel is biblical. Absolutely. And so for Paul to write things, these things to us, I think sometimes my temptation is to hear him say these things um, from a, a position or a place where he wasn't necessarily experiencing persecution just because of how calmly and coolly he seems to write. But that wasn't the case at all. Yeah, Paul was experiencing this in a very real way. And we hear echoes. I hear echoes um, of the gospel accounts of Christ's life, watching mm-hmm. him submit to government when it came to his own execution, entrusting himself to the one who judges justly, to God, and yet at the same time, his followers, you know, Peter and, and John, uh, in the book of Acts, when they're confronted with obeying the government and not preaching the gospel versus civil disobedience and preaching the gospel, who appeal to God himself and say, we have to obey God and not men. And so there is a real tension that you're talking about here. We're we're experiencing these same types of things, even if it's not in exactly the same way. Yeah, very much so. Paul Paul was uh, oftentimes arrested, put into prison because of preaching the gospel. And then because of the preaching of the gospel, seeing lives changed and overturned that affected the very communities they lived in, and it very infected also affected the financial aspect of those communities, like the Book of Acts and many other places where the gospel had an incredible impact. And they were just trying to say, hey, stop doing this because it's turning the world upside down. And we don't like that. But for most Christians, the difficulty in that society at that day was not so much the obedience to their law, Mm -hmm. but it was the accompanying thought and the accompanying requirement that Caesar is Lord. And because Caesar is not Lord, and there's only one Lord Jesus, that's where they got into trouble with Rome. Absolutely. Yes, there was a... Let me see if I can find it here. It's Tim Keller who... um, brings up that very point. He says that when Jesus was talking about paying taxes to Caesar um, and giving to Caesar what Caesar was owed, um, he says that Jesus' statement went very deeply into the consciousness of the early church. Mm -hmm. And he says Christians got into a great deal of trouble in the Roman Empire when people realized that they had an authority higher than the emperor, God himself, by which they could judge both him and the civic authorities. Christians have gotten into trouble in most eras for the same reason. And then he makes this incredible statement. He says, when the 17th century Stuart kings of England and Scotland claimed the divine right of kings, the Protestant minister Samuel Rutherford wrote a treatise against the idea called Lex Rex. That is, law is king. That is the biblical teaching that king is not the law but law, God's law, is king. Right. And so they were really feeling that tension, and we do too. Yes, we do. We absolutely do, because some things in the government asks us to do, we cannot participate. Yes. We cannot have anything to do with it. And I know that is difficult for some people to grasp. We have a dedication to our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And there's going to be a time, Shalini, I'm telling you, in the future, not very far off, yeah. where it is going to even be harder. It's going to be more difficult, more trials, more tribulations for a Christian. Mm-hmm. 
So he calls us to uh, pay taxes, which is important yes. because the government doesn't produce a product in one sense. The government uh, is there for good, as Paul is going to say. And so as long as the government is doing what is good and right, we pay taxes. But when the government turns to evil, I think that's where we have to draw the line. You know, so when Jesus was uh, in the temple area and people uh, asked him about, is it right to pay taxes? Is it right to do these things with the government? And somebody gave him a coin. He asked for a coin. They gave him and then he held it up and he said, whose image on this? And they said, it's Caesar's. Mm -hmm. And he says, then render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's. Mm -hmm. I think he's clearly saying, pay your tithe and pay your taxes. Right, right. I, I agree with you, Pastor Mike. And it seems like because we do know, and we'll get to that point as we continue in, in uh, Romans 13 here, but because we do know that Christ is returning, because we do know there is a time of tribulation coming, unlike the world has seen before, whether we will live through that or not, um, you know, we don't, there are different eschatological viewpoints about that. But regardless... There is coming a time where we are going to need to not um, conform to an evil government. Right. And so Paul's almost, I feel like he's saying, while the government <laughs> is in alignment with the things that God calls good, do it. Right. Let the default of your heart be to be submissive so that you don't set yourself up from the, from this point as a... A, a rebel that is just to be conquered. You know what I mean? So, so I mean, there's a, a part of this where it's like where the government is acting, where the government is what Paul calls God's servant, then do what's right. Right. Do what's good so, and do what's so right. So there's two principles here. The first principle is simply this, that you should obey the civil magistrates. That's simple. Right. That's the first principle. Right. The second principle balances that out by just simply saying you must always obey God. Mm -hmm. And so if number one goes against number two, then you do number two, right? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. That just sounded funny. But yes, I agree with you that that, um, that is absolutely the right, the right principle. In fact, um, Did I say that wrong? Yeah, you said it just perfectly, perfectly <laughs> fine, Pastor Mike. That was my own silliness uh, taking, coming into view there. But in any case, Keller says it this way. He says, on one hand... We obey the state, right, because our motivation is obedience to God who established the state. Yes. And so we have this motivation to obey the state because we understand that God is sovereign, that he puts people into power. He also can remove those same people from mm -hmm. power. Not everyone in power will worship God. But right. That doesn't mean that they're outside of the sovereign hand power or control of God. Right. Or that they're outside of the judgment of God. That's right. We are citizens of this country, mm -hmm. this this community we live in, and we are to obey them mm -hmm. uh, until it actually goes against the very things of God. Yes. And so I try to encourage people to do that, to live as good citizens, because all government is from God, yes. period. Yeah. And it, it doesn't make a distinction between good government and bad government. God establishes usia or exousia, power or authority is the Greek word that is used there, and we have to obey that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So even in Nazi Germany, obviously one of the probably more difficult examples to work through. Absolutely. In Nazi Germany, they still put people to death or punish them for murder. So that's a good thing. Now, the problem is the state became murderers. part of the vehicle for murderers. <laughs> right. right. So you don't participate in that part, mm -hmm. but you do because it's under the authority of God not saying that God approves everything that that government did, mm -hmm. but God allowed that in his providence for his purposes, for his glory, a very horrific war and a very horrific government to come into power. Yes. And he accomplished his will for, will for that. Remember, Paul is writing in the midst of this Roman government right. that is not a good government. Right. It does have good laws, but it also has a lot of laws that it will eventually lead into the place and the point because we don't say Caesar is Lord that they're going to impale us on a pole yes. and, and, and use us to, to light up 
the road on the way to Rome. Yes. Or put us in a Colosseum yes. and be fed the lions because we won't bow to the Caesar. Right. We won't bow to that Lord. So uh, that is hard, but that is necessary that we give God the first honor always. Yes, and and so again, this is Tim Keller say, says it this way. He says, we can never submit uncritically to what the state tells us. If it requires us to violate our conscience, we must disobey. Yeah, exactly. And, so, and, and I think fascinatingly, in some of these examples that you're talking about, Nazi Germany in particular, we see some of the most powerful testimonies of the Lord's people who do practice disobedience to the government um, like uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, like um, Corey Ten Boom, like, like Corey Ten Boom, and we see this disobedience practiced, and yet we see it practiced with a particular humility that does not violate the principles that Paul's laying out. There right. is still um, a beauty to the way that that disobedience was practiced yes. that brought glory to God and did not compound or add to the evil. It right. wasn't, they weren't participating in evil behavior that added to the evil, but rather overcoming evil by With good. good, which is right. exactly what Paul has just been talking to exactly, us about. Exactly, exactly. The worst form of government is no government. Right. Anarchy, mm -hmm. which you read in the Bible with every man doing what is right in their own eyes. Right. Or you read in the book of Genesis that they just did whatever they wanted to do. God had to come and exercise authority and judge the world mm -hmm. by a flood because they did continually wickedness. Yes, yes. Yeah, and so we look and see that ultimately our aim as believers is to see God glorified. And yeah. So we don't want to violate the principles of conscience. We don't want to violate God's um, principles of love that he has given us to govern who we are as people. Sometimes it sounds like Paul saying the default position for us is a, a calm, respectful submission. And where there is the need for disobedience, we still disobey in that way. In a respectful where, way. In a respectful way where the Lord's right. law requires it. Right. Um, and so... Is there anything else that you see in there that you think might be helpful for us to understand? Any nuances, any things that might have to do specifically with um, the way Paul appeals in verses 3 and 4 to fear and reward as motivations right. for um, submission to the government? How, how would you help us understand yeah, that? Yeah, so there's a couple of things going on there. One of the things is he does not bear the sword for nothing. Mm -hmm which means that God has given the right to the government to take into their hands the punishment of those who have done evil. The idea of bearing the sword obviously means, at this point, capital punishment, mm -hmm. that the government has the right to do that for the common good mm -hmm. in order that we might live in a peaceful society. Mm -hmm. So... I would, you know, the Nazi government, I use that as an example again, but if you committed murder in the Nazi government, you at least would go to trial, and if you were convicted, you would then face the death penalty. Mm -hmm. a, a good use of government. But then again, we ask ourselves about the death penalty. Is it good? Is it wise? Is it right? It's another understanding within Christianity where many people have chosen different positions that they kind of... Uh, have learned to accept. And I, I would say that most of the people argue from the point of view that uh, capital punishment is a deterrent. However, I don't think deterrent is the issue. I, I think that the main issue of capital punishment is justice. That's why the Old Testament, if you read it, the law is perfect. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You don't, do not do less in terms of punishing someone for what they have done, and you certainly don't do more. There needs to be a, an equalness to that. The crime needs, the punishment needs to fit the crime. And what the problem in our society today is, is that I think pretty much most people would agree with it. There's a huge disparity between getting justice and, and actually doing what is right. Today's government, you get a decision. You don't get justice. And there's a lot of disparity. 
rich people who get caught in a crime, who have ruined other people's lives, they, because of their wealth and their money, very rarely spend any time in prison. And if they do go to prison, it's like they call it club fed because you get everything. It's hardly like being in prison at all. That's terrible because that's an injustice. And then somebody who is poor, somebody does not have the ability to defend themselves, somebody who has to rely on a public defender, not only gets sentenced to prison, but gets a maximum crime at times that does not or is not equal to or the, a maximum punishment, I should say, mm -hmm. that does not fit or equal the crime. Sure. So there is a tremendous imbalance in that. Mm -hmm. And then there's another issue that comes up, war. We have to understand if the government says we are at war with somebody, what is the Christian to do? And there are multiple views on that. One is the view of pacifism, that I don't believe that it's right for uh, another Christian or another person to take the life of another human being, right. even in the act of a war. And that is called pacifism or Back in the days, they used to call them Connies because they were conscientious objectors. Mm -hmm. But if you've seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge, I think you can understand where this man served his country because he loved his country, but he did it in a way of not to take life, but to preserve life. Mm -hmm. And then there's another view where people say, my country, right or wrong, my country. And that was used by a lot of people during World War II, especially in Nazi Germany. They basically said, we were following what the government told us to do and so therefore we were obedient to the government mm -hmm. even in the war crimes that we committed we were still following orders that's a terrible way to do it because <laughs> you are placing the king over the lord and over the rule of law from god himself mm -hmm. so it is not king first and then country second or king first and then god second it's god first then king and then there's another view that was stated and worked on by the church that is called the just war theory. And that theory simply says we as a peaceful nation, if somebody comes and attacks us and invades our country, we have the right as a people to defend ourselves because the purpose of government, and we need to f understand this clearly, is to promote human life and well-being for everybody. And that I mean from the womb to the grave. We are to promote human life. And in in that scenario, we have to ask ourselves, is this war a just war or is it an evil war? Major difference between the World War II defending ourselves, attack where we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, and then in the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. where we went to war for reasons not because we got attacked, but to stop the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. And so it became a very controversial war. It became very divided as a nation. And people sit back and they feel, was it a just war? Well, that's the question you need to ask. Mm -hmm. Was it just? Was it right? Was it right for our government to do that? Mm -hmm. And that's what you got to wrestle with. And if it's not right, then you have the right to stand up to government and say, I won't go. I won't serve in this capacity because I don't think the war is just. But you got to be also willing to take the punishment for whatever the government outlays for you. Mm -hmm. You may end up suffering for righteousness sake. Yeah, and so we have a a principle in the scripture that I don't isn't often applied to in this particular context, but in any case where we understand that, that whatever we do as believers, we need to do fully committed unto the Lord, that our consciences need to bear witness before him. Yes. That the decisions that we're making, we're making because we believe him and trust him, not because we are afraid of government, not because we are afraid of the powers of men, but because our primary fear, as we use that word biblically, is of God, that we honor and serve and glorify him, that we are not trying to make or establish our own kingdoms, but trying to uphold the kingdom of God, even as citizens here on earth. Right. And so sometimes I think we get, that, that, that becomes difficult for us because we do want to 
assert and protect our own rights, particularly as Western sort of individualistic um, Americans. And so in, in some of those ways, it's almost where when we try to protect our own rights that we are in error and will and actually see um, or allow injustice for the sake of protecting our own rights. That's something that John Murray was speaking about when he was talking not, not just about uh, not, not necessarily about Paul and uh, the context of, of, of war in this particular uh, part of the chapter, but more in um, regard to the authority, the, the scope of the authority of the civil magistrate. And he was saying, John Murray says, over our individual lives, he says this, he says, we see how divergent from biblical teaching is the sentimentality that substitutes the interests of the offender for the satisfaction of justice as the basis of criminal retribution. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what you were talking about um, there regarding our court system, our legal system, and whether we really get justice or we get a decision. And in some ways, our court system and our legal system, I mean, they're limited in their scope of justice because they don't they are not like God. They don't have every piece of information. They can't make a decision based on on all of the facts that exist, only the ones that they know that they've been able to discover. And so ultimately we need to believe that God is the just judge. He's the only one yeah. qualified to judge perfectly. Yeah, so in cases for instance of capital punishment in the right. Old Testament it was based on two eyewitnesses. Right. Right. Today, we have the ability through uh, evidential things to look at uh, that are strong evidence, but we have to be careful as well because we have circumstantial evidence, right. and circumstantial evidence is not always the best evidence. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a law that I'm glad that was repealed, uh, and I'll you may agree or disagree, whatever, but... <laughs> For instance, the three strikes in your outlaw. Yeah. I mean, so a guy commits a crime, he's convicted. A guy commits another crime, he's convicted. And those crimes together don't amount to very much. But on that third one, he gets hammered and you're there for life. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any sense to me because now the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Mm -hmm. So you continue to exercise lawful justice for the crime that is committed, and please only do that. Do not go beyond that, which I think would be offensive to not only God, but to many people, men who are under that three strikes, you're outlaw. I can understand the reasoning behind it, mm -hmm. but gosh, so many guys ended up in prison for a long, long time based on that law, and if you added all of their three crimes that they committed together, the sentence was overwhelmingly harsh mm -hmm. and exceeded. judgmental it and exceeded, exceeded it, it right, yeah, what not the, correct. What the yes. And, and we have to live with the fact that we don't know everything. Right. We try to do the best that we can to discern. We try to use wisdom. But now it's not whether a person did wrong or right. We often argue about the technicalities of the law does the law can we find a loophole can we find some way that justifies what this person did and put the law on trial rather than put the person on trial in terms of what is good or bad right and so paul is encouraging us it seems pastor mike to have again that sort of that the that the governing principle of our hearts would be a submission born out of love um for God and for his people. Mm -hmm. And so that that should be, as, as he moves us here into the next part of the, of the chapter, he's basically saying, do, do what's right. Do, right. do what's right and, and pay your debts. Make sure that you don't owe anybody anything. And so that's kind of how he ended this section we just considered, that we were, are to pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed, that we don't put ourselves as a default position against or in rebellion um, to the government, to our fellow citizens, but rather we practice this respectful submission born out of love, knowing yes. that we're citizens of the kingdom but, of heaven. But notice what he's saying there. He's mm -hmm. not only saying paying your taxes and show respect 
and honor, mm -hmm. we have to understand the way in which they use the word honor, mm -hmm. right? Honor your father and your mother. Yes. It's not only I'm respectful to you, but the idea of honor means simply this, to take care of of your parents in their older age it is your responsibility to honor them and take care of them mm -hmm. so even when they use the word honor in terms of uh, muzzle not the ox while he treads and he talks about the role of the pastor he talks about double honor mm -hmm. so it isn't saying that we bow down to you and give you all this honor he's letting you know that there is a structure within God's system in terms of compensation, whether it was priests or whether it was in the New Testament pastors, teachers, and those who served in ministry to be honored, and that is a financial obligation upon the church to do so. Mm -hmm. And it always, I just have such a difficult time with people who choose not to honor the Lord in in any way. They try to get out of taxes and they don't either go to church or are even concerned about honoring the Lord and giving unto His work, right. and that is a that that is a, a an act of complete disobedience. Yeah. So, pay your tithe, pay your taxes, honor to whom honor is due. Right, That's and ultimately important. he's saying it's 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 fair. It's fair. It's fair in the church, but it's it's also fair in our civil responsibilities. That the yes. government is working on our behalf, and it's fair and right to pay our taxes. Yes. And so... Um, so, Shalini, let me ask you a yeah, question. Sure. The cry of our founding fathers was, No taxation without, without representation. representation. Can you find that in the Bible? See, no taxation? No, I don't believe I can. <laughs> Did I get the right answer? <laughs> so was our founding forefathers right or were they wrong? Oh, goodness. Um, I mean, I, I feel like you're asking me to, in in saying, are they were they right or were they wrong, to make a moral judgment, um, to make it actually to make an ethical just judgment based on a moral principle. Uh, were they right or were they wrong to say no taxation without representation? Um, I'm not in opposition at all to that principle that that people should um, pay. In I guess the way I would say it is unqualified taxes that we should just right. in an unqualified way, um, you know, pay taxes without having any kind of representation. In fact, that's something that I, if we were going to put it in a church context. Um, really appreciate about you, Pastor Mike, is that you have invited me, you've brought me and really fought 12 years ago to bring me on staff when I know that at the time for the church that wasn't an easy thing because of the position I hold, it was just generally a, a position held by a person who would be male, um, that it, there was some work you had to do to bring me on staff as being female. And I think that um, it's so good, not that it has to necessarily be me, but in a church setting to have both male and female representation in church leadership because you're leading a group of people and caring mm -hmm. for a group of people that is both male and female. So those perspectives are so helpful yeah. in having a better idea of how to care for people. So in the sense, if I were to, to put that in a governmental context, you know, no taxation without representation, do I think it's good to have representation for different people groups in order to understand more fully um, the makeup and the heart and the needs of those people so that you can best care for them? Absolutely. Do I think that we want to have people in a particular leadership structure in order to um, take advantage of, of other people or in order to uh, extort? Or I can't think of the word I'm trying to find in my mind right now. But um, no, I, I think that, that in that way, we have to trust God that he really is sovereign and just, that he will put people in position in government that sometimes even will disobey him or not honor him, and he'll deal with them too. Yeah. You know, and so I don't know if that's helpful or not, but in principle, yes, I believe it's helpful to have representation for um, the people who are under your care and charge. And I believe that that is what the Lord Jesus Christ did in mm -hmm. Becoming 
flesh and becoming incarnate, mm -hmm. that he came to represent us um, and took on the fullness of our humanity. And so it's, it, we have in him, again, as we always will, the consummate, perfect example of what this looks like. And so we become then without excuse for our own rebellious, unsubmissive hearts. So when Paul says submit because it's the right thing to do, ultimately we look to Christ who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and made him put himself in the form of a servant, taking on that very nature. Why? Because he needed to, to know who we were? No. That's the way that we would come to, to be represented by Christ. He would know who we were so that he might represent us before the Father. But he, he, he obviously didn't have to do that in his flesh, but he did. Mm. He, he practiced that submission. And so who are we to rebel then and say... I, you know, I don't need to do this when our Lord Jesus Christ himself took on flesh yeah. to take our place. It's yeah. just overwhelming to me. Yeah. In the, in the, in the context of the, the question, I would say there are two prominent Christian theologians who have dealt with the question of what is the purpose of government. Mm -hmm. One of them is Thomas Aquinas and the other is St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. So Thomas Aquinas believed that government, as a, as a Christian writing, he believed it was there to protect our commerce, to protect uh, and give us uh, equal rights financially to other people so that we are not taken advantage of. He argues from the point that everybody was created and given gifts and given abilities and a right to earn an income. And because of that, that income needs to be protected. And so it was very much that philosophy of the founding fathers that said tax, no taxation without representation. Sure. However, St. Augustine, who I tend to uh, align with more in the understanding of government, mm -hmm. believed that government was there for the protection and well-being of human life. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the government that was there under the king and looking at what it was doing with people, it was a government that was very much involved in slavery. Mm -hmm. And so I would have not said to the government, I'm not here to rebel against you because taxation without representation. I would have said, I'm not here to support you as a king and a government because you're taking the life of people. Mm -hmm. You're stealing them. Man stealing is definitely illegal in scripture. Mm -hmm. You're taking them. You're forcing them into a type of slavery that is the worst kind that has ever been seen on the face of this earth. And you're using it to promote your own benefits and your own wealth. So that would have been my argument. And I do know our founding fathers had trouble with that. And of course, later on, it became a split in our nation is exactly what do we do? Yeah. Are we going to have it or not? And when President Lincoln was uh, finally elected to the office, he was one who stood against it. But I also am a champion of a man by the name of Wilberforce who stood against slavery in Parliament and got the government to change and open and did outlaw slavery, which I think is good for the protection of uh, uh, rights of God's people from human human life. And so I, I would have rebelled. Yes, I would have rebelled on different grounds because my rebellion, I think, reflects hopefully a better understanding of the biblical viewpoint of government. So we had a lot of reasons why we broke away. Some of them good, some of them not good. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to discern and go through all of those different places because you had preachers on both sides preaching break away from the government. And depending upon where you are and what you, how you understood human government, you either had the right or, or not to have the right. Sure. Yeah. And so essentially Paul's just saying do, do what's right. Do what's right in the eyes of God and... As we just saw um, in chapter 12, as much as it depends on you, right. live peaceably with all. Right. And so to that end, he's going to finish. Let's just go ahead and finish our chapter 13. And uh, we won't go in depth into these next verses because we're just about out of time. But I think that they come to bear on what we're talking about um, here and why, why it is that we can, as God's people, live this way. Yeah. So basically he says... 
owe no one anything. Meaning these debts that you that you legitimately owe, pay them. Don't leave them outstanding. Yeah, I don't think he's right? saying you can't borrow. I think right. he's saying when the bill comes due, pay it. Pay it. Yeah. 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 So owe no one anything, but then he, he, he puts an exception. This is verse 8. Except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Yeah. For the commandments, you shall not commit mur- adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Mm. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. Mm. The day is at hand. Mm-hmm. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh yes. to gratify its desires. Oh gosh, there's a couple of sermons there. <laughs> at least, at least. You know, when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, of course, the first commandment is to what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your might. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. I've heard sermons where it says, love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. Oh, my. The only problem with that is that (laughs) Jesus said, upon these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. So So the two commandments, yeah, where's Mm -hmm. the third one come Mm -hmm. in? Love yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think that you know. I, I'm sorry, I, Whitney Houston. I, I hate to <laughs> say the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. Right. The greatest love of all is what Christ did for you. Yes. And I think if you focus in and center in on that, that will help you understand and give you a accurate self image of who you are in Christ. Yes. Because now we have a new identity. Absolutely. Yeah. And because he's as he draws us, ultimately, Christ is coming back. Yeah. He is returning. The 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 time is nearer now than, than ever we, before. Than we believed or than we ever have experienced before. And so we live today in light of that day. Amen. Of that coming day. So Come under- quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. That the, that the kingdom of God um, was inaugurated, the way that we are experiencing it now, was inaugurated in the first coming of Christ and will be consummated in a second coming, where we will understand it and live in it in its fullness. And until yeah. that day, we honor God by honoring one another, by demonstrating love as it um, conforms not to the world, but to the much higher standard of Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. Yeah. So. Let's just think about that. Laying down your life for another person. Yes. It's incredible. It is. And that's the standard we're called to. So that on the day Christ returns, he might receive glory and honor and praise from our lives. Yeah. So let's live that way, friends, um, as as well as we are able, as we fix our eyes on Christ, on Christ's example, and ultimately um, toward his return. We believe and have confidence that uh, that he is coming, and so we will not be put to shame uh, if we live this way. Yeah. So thank you, Pastor Mike. Next week we'll turn our attention to Romans chapter 14, and we hope that all of you who are listening will join us then. Thanks oh, that'll again. be a great discussion. Absolutely. All the issues that are audiophoria, <laughs> we'll bring all those up and okay. talk about them. Well, we won't define that word, so just leave people with that I'll little leave, cliffhanger. I'll, leave, I'll give them so that, that little cliff link. They'll want to come all back. Right. Thank okay. you again.